Well, good morning, friends. So I just want to say a few things as we roll into our sermon time. I guess before we do that, I just want to talk about a few good things that are happening in the life of our church, just to catch up a little bit. So last Sunday, we spent some good time together talking about the grace of God that is given to us and how that grace is not only kind of given in us as radical acceptance and love and forgiveness, but it's also a grace that's lived through us as outrageous generosity. And we connected this to our story here at Salt House of Generosity, how we've been, we've given away our ground level to sold land for the sake of engaging homelessness on the east side. And last week then we presented our budget, right, for the fiscal year as an invitation into this next year of generosity as a community, enabling us to further our impact by continuing our current staffing configuration, which calls us to growth in our budget by at least $80,000 talk about outrageous generosity for this next year, yes? Especially in this unknown time of COVID. Then after worship, we also had a budget Zoom call, a forum together. By the way, it was our best attended uh, budget forum ever. It was awesome. There were 27 of us. It was so good for my heart to see so many of you with your really long hair and your pajamas. It was awesome. So thank you for that. But in that call, there was such support for the generosity that we are asking y'all to embody in this year to come. Because there's such a sense that in this time of COVID and recognizing that Black Lives Matter, that people are awakening to their priorities and what's important. And what we're doing here together is unique and vital and important. So we're excited to invest in life together here in the year to come. So that'll happen last week, and this is all in preparation because next week, Sunday, June 28th, we want you here for worship on Sunday morning and then to call in for our annual meeting via Zoom afterwards. And so um, with that coming, I just want to say a few more things about how you can get ready for that this week, okay? So to be ready, now is your time to review that budget. If you haven't heard the presentation, we've posted that online. You can review the PDF, all the numbers that's also posted. We also posted the recording from our Zoom call, so you can check that out too. Um, and then share your feedback. If you have questions, concerns, we want to hear that early this week because we don't really plan to have much more conversation in the meeting uh, when we gather next week. So do your homework, let us know what you're thinking, okay? Then in order to be on that Zoom call next week, uh, we'll be emailing out the link for that call. So be sure we have your email address. You can send it to info at salthousechurch.org. And if you have any concerns about the tech of that, or if you wanna call in on your phone, be sure to let us know if you need any help this week and we can get you set up so that you're ready too. So we're also asking everyone to register as a member, even if you already are one. It's really a chance to affirm, again, your intention uh, here at Slot House. So please go online and take a few minutes just to register as a member today, if possible. Thanks to the many who have already done that. And if you're not a member, we invite you to consider if Salt House is home for you for this next season. And then make that intentional choice and register. There's an FAQ about membership on our website. I'm available to answer questions. If you don't want to right now and you're good, like that is fine too, okay? So do all these things this week as we get ready for next Sunday as we do the work we must do every June to be a legal nonprofit in Washington State, but also as we set our vision together for what's to come in this year ahead. So thank you, thank you, my friends. All right, so thank you, important stuff. I wanna be sure that we covered that, but now, we begin our sermon time. So as we do, again, just roll those shoulders back, be in touch with your breath as we open our hearts and our minds to God in this time. And as we do this, we are still physically distanced, right? There is still a pandemic. So we just acknowledge as we come to this time, the stress, the loneliness that we all carry with us. And we name how we are not alone. I invite you just to feel that deep within you that our God, we've been talking about God as Trinitarian, God as the Trinity as three in one, is our God as a relationship. And that relational energy that the Trinity shares, it's been called a circle dance of love. This God of ours is with you even now, giving you that grace that we named last Sunday. Let that just be true and close for you now. Just breathe that in, be in that dance. Let grace fuel you for the work that we'll do together now. Because what I heard God inviting us into today 
is to talk about two things that as on the calendar, we find ourselves on this Sunday, we're smack in between two things. One is Juneteenth, that was on Friday, June 19th, and then next weekend is Pride Weekend. And I heard God saying that we, as God's people, we need to talk about these things. And we need to know them as part of our story. So that's actually what we're going to do today. We'll talk about them, then we're going to hold them alongside the Jesus story, as we always do. And it's okay if, as we go through this, you already know all of this information that I share and talk about. And it's also okay if some of it's completely new to you. So we position ourselves always as God's people who are ready to learn and unlearn when necessary too. So taking time with this, it just, it feels important to practice what it means to be people who learn, who Jesus as our rabbi, as our teacher, right? People who learn together, especially in this time in our country, okay? So that's like the intention that we hold as we go into this, okay? So let's dive in. So first, Let's talk about Juneteenth. So I don't know about you, but it was, you know, I noticed Juneteenth like pop up on my Google calendar in the past few years. And I will admit that I did not know what it was. How about you? Like moment of truth. When did you first hear about, know about Juneteenth? Is it this year? Because people are really starting to talk about, which is wonderful. Is this the moment? Are you curious to find out what it is? So just to orient us in our learning, I just, I want to read um, an, from an article uh, from Vox, from their website, and it's called Why Celebrating Juneteenth is More Important Now Than Ever, It's Time for America to Truly Grapple with Its Legacy of Slavery, and it's by P.R. Lockhart, and I just want to read this because it gives a really good account of kind of the facts, but also it connects Juneteenth to the continued arc of injustice for black Americans. And, and that's just important for us to hear that connection. So this it's, it was actually written two years ago, so it's not precisely current, but it is current, okay? So here it is. As the Civil War came to a close in 1865, a number of people remained enslaved, especially in remote areas. Word of slavery's end traveled slowly, and for those who were largely isolated from Union armies, life continued as if freedom did not exist. This was especially the case in Texas, where thousands of enslaved people were not made aware of freedom until June 19, 1865, when Union General Gordon Granger arrived in Galveston and issued an order officially freeing them. Their celebration would serve as the basis of June 19th, or Juneteenth, a holiday celebrating emancipation in the U.S., in many ways, Juneteenth represents how freedom and justice in the U.S. has always been delayed for black people. The decades after the end of the war would see a wave of lynching, imprisonment, and Jim Crow laws take root. What followed was the disproportionate impact of mass incarceration, discrimi discriminatory housing policies, and a lack of economic investment. And now, as national attention remains focused on acts of police violence, and various racial profiling incidents, it is clear that while progress has been made in black America's 150 years out of bondage, considerable barriers continue to impede that process. Those barriers may remain until America truly begins to grapple with its history. Juneteenth is a necessary moment of observation because our government and to a certain degree, our nation and our culture has not really acknowledged the trauma of four million enslaved people and their descendants. It hasn't acknowledged the impact this institution has had on this country and, is, and continues to have on this country. There hasn't been a national accounting, and the Juneteenth holiday is a reminder of that. And it will continue to be a reminder and a haunting until we do. Did you know all of that? Juneteenth is celebrated as a day that marked emancipation, but there is a shadow over it. For we know even now, freedom is not, has not fully arrived. There's a Juneteenth t-shirt actually, and it says, free-ish, since June 19th, 1865. And it is only free-ish, isn't it? As we watch the unfolding protests and more police brutality, 
as so many of us dig in and listen and learn from black writers and authors and directors and influencers, we are learning the non-whitewashed history of our country as well as hearing the lived experience of our black beloveds. And it is not freedom. And that is not okay. This week marked the anniversary of the Emanuel Nine, the nine black Christians who were shot in a Bible study at Emanuel African Methodist Episcopal Church in Charleston, South Carolina by a 21-year-old white Lutheran man. Lord have mercy. This is not freedom, which is why the cry continues that black lives matter. So there's, there's so much more to say, but there's just a little bit about Juneteenth, okay? So I invite us to hold that and then also talk about Pride Weekend, which is, which is coming up this next weekend. It's always the last weekend of June. Do you know the origins of Pride? I, I just want to read two short pieces about it. From The first is from the History Channel's webpage uh, for their On This Day for June 28th. And this is what it says. Sometime after midnight on this day in 1969, in what is now regarded by many as history's first major protest on behalf of equal rights for LGBT people, a police raid of the Stonewall Inn, a popular gay club located in New York City's Christopher Street, turns violent as patrons and local sympathizers begin rioting against the police. Soon the crowd began throwing bottles at the police, the protests spilled over into the neighboring streets and order was not restored until the deployment of New York's riot police sometime after 4 a.m. The Stonewall riots were followed by several days of demonstrations. The next year, in 1970, New York's first official gay pride parade set off from Stonewall and marched up 6th Avenue. And then I also want to read uh, from the New York Times. It was written earlier this month. It's an introduction in the article of, it's called Eight Stories About Queer Power and Defiance by Kurt Soler, who writes, Stonewall was a riot. This has become the de facto slogan to describe the series of early summer 1969 demonstrations that took place in front of New York City's Stonewall Inn, the gay bar that became a battleground for the movement that catalyzed LGBTQ rights in this country. Indeed, this historic rebellion is the reason we celebrate Pride Month each June. But as America rages on against an uncured pandemic, as well as its, as well as its after effects, and for justice following the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and others at the hands of police, that phrase, Stonewall was a riot, has taken on new resonance. It's an assertion that fighting, not partying, is the root of our story. And this year, as many join in protests chanting, Black Lives Matter, we are reminded that the Stonewall liberation was led by trans women of color, including Marsha P. Johnson and Sylvia Rivera, two activists whom city officials decided last year to honor with a monument after decades of progress being too often attributed to mostly white gay men. One of the joys of being queer is joining a glorious, creative, sometimes contentious, constantly shifting and growing tribe. And yet it's our collective struggle, our efforts to disband the heterosexual patriarchy that ultimately binds and defines us, whether through public protest, private art making, or just daily life as an LGBTQ person. It's defiance against society that makes us who we are. And the fight continues. So friends, did you know the origins of pride? Did you know that fighting, not partying, is the root of the story? Also, did you know that until Monday's incredible decision from the Supreme Court, it was legal in more than half of the states, legal in more than half of the states, for, to fire workers just for being gay, bisexual, or transgender? So Juneteenth and pride, Okay, I invite us just to hold all of this as we turn to our scripture reading for today, which is Mark chapter 3. This is Jesus in the synagogue on the Sabbath. So I invite you just to picture this scene as it's unfolding as Jesus interacts with the Pharisees and an individual in need of healing. Our reader today is Jeannie Goodrich. This is a reading from Mark chapter 3, verse 1 through 6 from the Inclusive Bible. Returning to the synagogue, Jesus met someone who had a withered hand. 
Now the religious authorities were watching to see if Jesus would heal the individual on the Sabbath day, as they were hoping for some evidence to use against Jesus. He said to the afflicted one, Stand and come up front. Then Jesus turned to the Pharisees and said, Is it permitted to do a good deed on the Sabbath, or an evil one, to preserve life or destroy it? At this they remained silent. Jesus looked around them with anger, for he was deeply grieved that they had closed their hearts so. Then Jesus said to the person, Stretch out your hand. The other did so, and the hand was perfectly restored. The Pharisees went out at once and began to plot with the Herodians, discussing how to destroy Jesus. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you, Jeannie. So Jesus in the synagogue on the Sabbath brings an individual forward who has his shriveled hand and asks the Pharisees, is it permitted to do good on the Sabbath or an evil one? Is it to preserve life or destroy it? You see, there are over 200 Sabbath laws, a list of don'ts, really, like things to not do so that God's people would just like have a day to be with Yahweh, remembering who they are, worshiping God, trusting that God would provide for them. The Sabbath was about life at its best, a life connected in the life of God, a life of love. According to Sabbath law, healing could only happen on the Sabbath if it was a matter of life or death. So for Jesus to do this was to break Sabbath law, right? He's testing the Pharisees because the Pharisees had been misusing the practices of Sabbath law, using them really as a tool to control, not as a pathway into life. The rules had become more important than the people that they were intended to serve, and the system was no longer working because those with power, the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they were exploiting the needs of those who didn't have power. It sounds familiar, yes? How we're awakening to how our country was designed with laws and rules and just ways of being that we thought were awesome and we're realizing that it's only awesome according to the white heterosexual patriarchy to, to those who have had the power. What does Jesus do in the synagogue? He confronts the system. How the system isn't doing the loving, caring, like grounding in God that it was designed to do. And he asks, like, isn't life the point? Like, isn't goodness the point? Healing the point? Wasn't the point that the system was connecting us to life? And what do the Pharisees say? What do they do? What does the text say? They did nothing. They said nothing. It says, at this, they remained silent then notice the anger. Notice Jesus' anger. It says Jesus looked around at them with anger, for he was deeply grieved that they had closed their hearts so. This was the moment for them to speak and say, yes, the Sabbath is to do good and to save life, to use their power, right, for good. But they remained silent in that synagogue full of people. They could have spoken up and said something but they don't. And Jesus is angry at their silence. My friends, there are voices in the Christian tradition that would have us believe that the love of Jesus, that the love of Jesus is simply just like a warm, fuzzy, like platitude filled experience. And I don't know where that comes from or what gospel they're reading to get to that conclusion because throughout the New Testament, Jesus is drawing God's people back to the love that was designed from the beginning. And he does it by intentionally, radically, and passionately addressing the diverse and complicated conflicts of the time and shattering the status quo. The kind of like salvation and healing that Jesus teaches and embodies, it isn't about following a moral code or like an individualistic path of faith. He addresses political, social, and racial issues. This is what the love of God looks like. It's in the synagogue. It's, it's confronting those in power. Author and influencer Austin Channing Brown, she described love like this earlier this week, and you may have seen it too. She said, I believe firmly 
that to practice love is to disrupt the status quo, which is masquerading as peace. I'll say it again. I believe firmly that to practice love is to disrupt the status quo, which is masquerading as peace. Man, it's like she was in that synagogue that day, right? Except she would be the one to speak up, to say this isn't peace. What's happening here is not peace. So Brown goes on to say, we are taught that love is many things, but rarely do we think of love as risky, as disruptive, as noisy, as angry. That's causing holy trouble. But I'm convinced that the pursuit of justice is loving, and this kind of love shakes the tables. My friends, Jesus causes holy trouble in the face of power that is being misused. And we're talking about Juneteenth and pride in a sermon today because we need to know these historical stories as our stories. We can no longer be complicit to systems where power is being abused. We can no longer be blind to the racism within us. We cannot we cannot, not know the stories of our black siblings and our LGBTQ siblings because it's not peace because to love our neighbors in the way of Jesus is the kind of love that shakes the tables. And I bring all of this up on this Sunday, just to point out June, 2020, like where we are right now, we are surrounded on all sides with issues of injustice, yes? Do you feel that too? It is overwhelming. And I wanna name how this, being surrounded by all this injustice, this is how it's supposed to be for us this kind of saturated with injustice place, this is the sweet spot where the people of God are supposed to be, we're supposed to be in it. I just wanna offer an, a wild affirmation for all of us who, uh, just to hear who are feeling exhausted, disappointed, despairing, confused, and angry on behalf of our black siblings, our LGBTQ siblings, that we are right where we should be as a people of God. Like this is what holy trouble feels like, right? Are you feeling weary? Me too, man. And you know what? We should be because the kingdom of God is where righteous anger is put into loving action. The kingdom of God is where righteous anger is put into loving action. Friends, holy trouble is the work that we do with our anger and causing holy trouble, it's exhausting. So I just offer this as a word of comfort and perspective and encouragement. Good servant, I know you are tired, but you are on the right track and you are not alone. And as we are like here in it as God's people, we realize that being surrounded by overwhelm and fear and injustice is what our black and LGBTQ siblings live with every day, right? So for us to feel it too, beloved, you're feeling it too? Okay, you are on the right track. Just even for me, it was on Friday, it was the last day of school, it was Juneteenth, you know, and at the end of the day, I realized there was just like too many things for me to feel that day. And I, I realized I wasn't as emotionally present to like the last day of school. Like we're done with kindergarten now forever, oh, you know? And instead of just like, I, I could have felt bad about not feeling it and not being as present as I wanted to be, but I just let myself name that it's okay because I am, we are in the midst of awakening to this insidious racialization of our country in the midst of a pandemic. And so I think it's okay if my capacity for feeling a little, like if that capacity to feel is a little lacking for today, right? Your own sadness, your overwhelm, your anger, it's okay, my friends. We can feel all the things of being in it, including the overwhelm, including just how angry we can feel, all of it. Jesus got angry too. And Jesus asks of us, will we remain silent? <clears throat> I, am, <clears throat> I am just so grateful for you, for y'all, for Salt House. Since day one, we have been a radically welcoming place for the LGBTQ community. Love is love. And we'll keep pushing the bounds of what that means and what it means to be allies. And I thank God for that because the church has too often caused hurt and harm. And for those of 
us who ourselves have experienced or those who we love have experienced, like for those who have felt that hurt and harm from the church, I am so sorry for the ways in which the gospel has been used as a tool for exclusion, for shaming, for diminishing the fullness of your sexuality and your identity. I am sorry. It is unacceptable. You, our LGBTQ siblings, man, have always been radically welcomed here and held in key leadership roles in this community. And we here at Salz, we're awakening to how, and we're getting to work on how we can be even more radically welcoming of our black siblings and anti-racist on their behalf. And I am so sorry for the pain that the church has caused our black and indigenous people of color for all the ways that you have been made to feel less than. We will not stay silent. We must do more. And I am so grateful that we get to do this together. It is such holy trouble that we get to cause together. So my friends, as you hold all of this, I, the question that I ask of you is just how are you now or how will you cause some holy trouble? What's that looking like now? What could it look like? How is God inviting you to speak up, to pursue justice through loving and shaking the tables? To close this out, I just want to offer a few ways forward into some ways to cause some holy trouble. There are so many more than this, uh, but as you hear this word of encouragement, again, to know that you are where you are supposed to be if you are in the thick of injustice, we do have a few things that I want to point uh, to here at Salt House so just listen to see if God is nudging you through these or if other ideas come to mind. And I'm just going to rip through these real quick, okay? So listen up. So five things. First is to join the conversation. And what I mean by that is like join a group. You know, growth happens in relationship, right? In conversation, when we make the circle, and even if it's a circle where we have to wear masks or it's happening on Zoom, right? So we are creating groups that will launch in these next few weeks where people can do this work together. Zoom groups, yes, we are, we are doing some socially distanced in-person groups too. Uh, we need more leaders and we want to hear from you what, what's speaking to you, what you want to read or talk about. So please reach out and let Pastor Ryan know what you'd like to do, lead, what's speaking to you as we form these groups, okay? Okay. Number two, use the resources to take action. And by the resources, I mean right now there are so many lists and recommendations out there for action right now. And it is to learn and to listen, like so much of it is that. So it's stuff to read, it's movies, but it's also stuff to do with our time and our money. So use those resources. I will commend to you one resource that dear friends of mine, Tara DeMant and Christopher Watson, they created in collaboration with academics, activists, and leaders across the country. It was released on Juneteenth and it's called Independence Day. And has, it says Independence Day for all and Independence Day for action. And it is a toolkit for organizing in solidarity with Black Lives on July 4th, 2020. So it can be used now leading up to July 4th, and it's just packed with really good stuff. So we'll share that link uh, via Facebook and on other, in other ways today and this week as well. But really, it's just such a great resource, one of the best I've seen. So use the resources. And then on July 4th, we are going to protest. So this is the 13, the third thing, cause some holy trouble by protesting here at Salt House. We're planning a protest here. Or we're creating a family-friendly, like one hour long, everyone wears a mask and, st and stays six feet away from each other. Bring your own sign and stand on the street here at Salt House uh, so that we can stand as a community to say together that black lives matter. So we're going to do that on the weekend of July 4th. We're still deciding where to put that. If you want to help choose kind of when the best time is and some of the logistics of what that's going to look like, let Pastor Ryan know uh, to help coordinate. We welcome, too, prayers of support from those who don't want to come or who can't, so you can be part of it in that way, too. Fourth thing, engage with Pride Weekend. So Pride is, has gone online because of COVID. So tune in, join in on the action, listen, learn, and celebrate next weekend. Also the show Queer Eye, who's a fan? Yeah, on Netflix. If you haven't seen it yet, watch the first episode of the new season. So this is season five, first episode, episode one. The Fab Five, they treat, they go to, to be with a gay Lutheran pastor in Philadelphia. 
it's a wonderful episode. It's a wonderful celebration of the ELCA, our denomination that we're a part of, and the intersection of faith and sexuality and self-love. So then this week, so watch that, because we're going to release a few things, tag a few things, a few articles and videos that from the ELCA and other sources about that episode and how Pastor Hepler is doing kind of one year after that filming happened. So uh, watch that, and then we'll have some fun resources to go with it, too. And then fifth and finally, we sent it out on social this week, uh, but in case you missed it, watch the video of Pastor Ryan's master's thesis on the theology of riot. It's awesome. Also awesome, Pastor Ryan's hair at that time. So I'm just saying, check it out. Um, But seriously though, Pastor Ryan, like he adds so much depth to today's conversation and our current global moment. So use that resource too, how all of this ties into the Jesus story and God's story. All right, so friends, like Austin Channing Brown, I believe firmly that to practice love is to disrupt the status quo, which is masquerading as peace. This is what Jesus does in the synagogue and what we, uh, and what we do too. We will not stay silent. So in the next few minutes, as we turn to a time of singing, uh, singing about how we're inviting God to lead us into life, I invite you to hold all of this and see what God has to say to you about it, okay? Then friends, let's do what God's people have always done and continue causing some holy trouble together. Amen? Amen.